have a debut. Spencer Bivens, who he's not young. Well, 29 years old. But it's a great story. I mean, he's been all over the place, including France. I didn't even know they had a league over there. He got him. The first hitter he faces in the big leagues, he's got a strikeout. Look, when you've been on playing baseball, and this is your 13th season, and you finally get to the big leagues, they're all rooting for him. We all are. It's just a great story of perseverance. All right, yeah, Spencer, appreciate you hopping on the uh, podcast. Uh, obviously, you've got a super crazy story, and, uh, you know, we've, We've had the opportunity to, be, to play some small part in that, obviously, but I uh, just wanted to get you on here um, mid-season when, you know, you've, you've recently had a little bit of time up in the big leagues with the, the San Francisco Giants and um, just kind of share your story a little bit on the channel. Um, because I know for me, you know, having kind of come through similar trials and tribulations through like my early and middle parts of my own career, like I can really relate to, to a lot of the, the struggles and ups and downs from your story. Um, but first off, just want to thank you for, for taking the time to hop on. Yeah, Ben. I mean, it's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. You guys are you guys are awesome with what you do. I really appreciate it. My uh, so I guess to start my story, you know, I got cut at Penn State um, after going to junior college. I uh, ended up transferring to a Division two school. I ended up my senior year like eighty eight, ninety one, touching ninety two. Had a good year. Thought I might get drafted. Nothing happened. Um, I ended up going to play in France because I had a friend from junior college that was over there that kind of connect the dots for me a little bit. Um, came back, didn't know really what I wanted to do, if I wanted to stay in Europe or if I wanted to like try to explore baseball and like pro baseball in America. Um, but I ended up signing with the Czech Republic team in 2020 and then the pandemic hit and took out all those plans. So I ended up playing in like a, a little pod league in a independent field, um, the Washington wild things played pretty well there, got a contract offer to play there for 21. Um, went there in 21, made the team out of spring training. You know, you're going against guys that are coming back from affiliate ball and, you know, all sorts of different people. So that was my first real, you know, you've got pro ball stuff. So, Made the team, was there for about two months, got released. Uh, I'm trying to exhaust every resource, all the friends I have in you know, different independent leagues. I'm seeing if they need an arm. Ended up with the Charleston Dirty Birds. Uh, ended up getting traded two weeks later to Gastonia. Didn't even know that there were trades in indie ball at this time. Right. So I go, I finish the season, finish the 21 season in Gastonia as a starting pitcher. Um, Typically, like a four seam, like trying to do 12 six curve ball, and had a crappy slider, and you know, my stuff wasn't, you know, really refined. Right. Uh, that, t that 21 to 22 off season is when I did tread remote and really went like all in. Um, and I, you know, was doing this by myself, I didn't like have people to train with. So I'm, you know, I'm talking to Jason and he's helping me like deal with the, the data so there's a lot of data with your program um and like there's a lot of you know soft tissue stuff you got to focus on um he's walking me through the steps of it and i'm took me a little bit the first couple of weeks to get it down but then i got it down and then four months in um i'm going into spring training with roughly two months left of uh, remote and uh, i get to since i play in, in gastonia uh, it's, you know, it's really close to Charlotte. So I actually got to come in and, you know, see Jason in person and go through some of the mechanical tweaks in person. And that's, I think, when things really clicked for me. You know, I hadn't been on a radar gun at all the, the off season. And then uh, first uh, spring training outing, I was like 93 to 95. You know, I hadn't even like really sniffed like 93, 94 consistent at all. Um, and I'm just sitting it now with power sink and then I got picked up by the Giants like two weeks into that season and was the first guy uh, from the Atlantic League in 22 and I think our buyout was like 10 or 15 grand so people were kind of weary of it but you know uh, that's how I got to the Giants and now here in 2024 AAA and you know, a little bit of showtime just trying to trying to stay there you know Awesome. Let's let's uh let's backtrack a little bit because I want to dive into the story like before you even like reached out to Tread before you came here, uh, and and worked with us both in person and also remotely. Like, take me through like who was Spencer Bivens in high school. Take me through like that college journey in a little bit more detail because I, I don't think 
you know, people see you now as, you know, a guy with some big league time throwing upper 90s. And it's like, it's hard to really conceptualize and, and maybe put themselves like in your situation. And like, um, you know, what, what level of talent were you in high school? How many offers did you have out of high school? Like, were you, were you a prospect type guy or were you just a guy like trying to find anywhere to play in college? I was a guy that was like on a very mediocre uh, travel team, you know, kind of at a central PA, like I wasn't on one of these like East coast pro teams or like a mid Atlantic Canes or anything like that. Uh, I probably threw 80 to 85 in high school it was six foot four, you know, 170 pounds. Didn't really put in much effort in the weight room. Um, and that definitely held me back. Um, but you know, I wasn't all the way focused on baseball, but I knew I wanted to play in college. Uh, I didn't, I got some interest at a James Madison tournament. Uh, I pitched really well there against, you know, one of those prospect teams. Um, but you know, I didn't have the grades to go there. Um, had some D3 looks and offers, but I knew that that really wasn't the route I wanted to do. So I ended up going to junior college. I went to Lewisburg College in North Carolina, like outside of Raleigh. Um, not a lot of people know that, actually. Um, in some of the interviews I've done, Lewisburg doesn't get a whole lot of... I don't think I've heard of it either, yeah. Yeah, but I went to Lewisburg College for two years, and I played with Cedric Mullins, and he's like probably our most notable guy. Even in junior college, I, I didn't creep up my velo too much higher. Uh, my first year, I threw maybe a third of an inning. Um, probably should have redshirted in hindsight. But my sophomore year, I was more like 84 to 88, you know, getting some interest, but mainly just like D2. And I knew that I wanted to like try to go back and play at Penn State. And that's really where my goal was. Um, and then that, I, I guess it was that 2014 summer going into the fall of my first semester at Penn State. And I put in an effort in the weight room, gained about 10 pounds, still could have put in a better effort, I think. But I, you know, I tried out for the team at Penn State and, and I made it uh, and I got to like 90 in the bullpen. So that was a big deal for me. I, first time I, I touched 90 was in that bullpen. And uh, yeah, so high school wise, I, I was not a prospect of any means. Looking back, do you, do you feel like you, do you feel like you had the work ethic back then or is that something you had to develop? Like, is that something that you, you kind of maybe took for granted earlier in your career or is it like you knew how to work hard? You just didn't know what you needed to actually like do from a training standpoint, nutrition standpoint. Like, was it a knowledge thing or yeah. was it a work ethic thing or was it a little bit of both earlier in your career? Uh, it was probably both, but I'd say it was more on the work ethic. Like I, I honestly did not put in the work I should have. And I would recommend to any high school kid to get in the weight room as, you know, kind of as soon as possible. Right. Um, but yeah, I definitely a work ethic thing. And I, you know, I kind of regret that now, but I'm happy to have found it later in my career. Yeah. So take me back to like in, in high school, you were said you were six four one seventy ish. What did you mm -hmm. like, what did you end college at uh, like body weight wise? In college, the, my last year, I'd probably say I was like 200, okay. roughly like 190 to 200, still like not that much bigger. But, you know, I, I started to do like some some plyo balls and some weighted ball programs and it helped me creep up there a little bit. And then once you started playing overseas, like g give me an idea of what that was like. Um, were you still like 6'4", 6 6'5", 6 200 when you were playing overseas? Because I know you were like in the 90, 91, 90, 92 range when you. Yeah. Were... So I was I was still growing like uh, when I was gaining weight just that and, and getting my diabetes like kind of. Uh, dialed in a little bit more um, when I was in France it was kind of like okay I don't know what I'm going to do with baseball so it's kind of like a paid vacation um, I still worked hard over there I still went to the gym but you know I didn't really know you know what my plan was going to be so I still tried to you know compete and be the best me that I could be um, but it's not like I was I could have done a lot more, I suppose, but I, you know, I just didn't have that thought process of, you know, be in Europe and that's what's just going to be my career. For sure. So what, what was the competition like in France? I, I, I didn't think the announcer said in your uh, debut, maybe that clip, they were like, they didn't even know there was a league over there. And I didn't know there was a league over there either. Is that like yeah, pretty low level competition or was it like a surprisingly decent level of competition? 
I would say it was like surprisingly decent. I expected it to be, you know, like kind of adult league ish. Right. Um, but there were there were a lot of like ex minor leaguers over there, mainly like Venezuelan and Dominican guys that were trying to immigrate into into France and into Europe. So I saw like every team had like four or five import guys that were, you know, either Latin or like with minor league time, and then the rest would be you know, a little bit of college, you know, ranging from D1 to like D3. Um, but then the French, the, some of the French guys, you know, tickered, tickered down a little bit, but a lot of them also play for like their national team. Uh-huh. So it's still, it's still competitive, but for a pro league, you know, it's, you know, on the lower end, I'd say. But yeah, I was, I was pleasantly surprised with some of the guys I was playing against. Gotcha. So, so let's fast forward then you, you go, you play the, you kind of do the indie ball circuit in the U S you end up in Gastonia, you end up hooking up with, with tread. Um, was the fact that you were like pretty close to the facility in Gastonia, like a prime reason why you started working with us at that point in time, or would you have, were you kind of looking for something no matter what, and just happened to be a nice coincidence that you ended up being pretty close by the facility? Yeah, I was, I was pretty, pretty sure that I was going to do it regardless, but it just happened to be a, a pretty good coincidence that Gastonia is very close. I've been following you guys for a while um, and I really like your approach and I really like, you know, the in, in in-person coaching and like have the personal touch of it and how you guys do pitch development. Um, I remember talking to Jason, like in the videos I would send him remotely. He didn't like, he didn't necessarily believe my two seam really moved. And then I I came in, I came in house and we played catch. He's like, Oh damn, that, that thing actually does have some bite to it. Right. Well, you didn't. You probably that, didn't have a ton of yeah. a ton of validated metrics at that point, right? Because you, you no. just had any ball any ball uh, stats, and like you didn't have a way to yeah. actually see the metrics at that point. I had never never been on a TrackMan before. Um, well, I probably I had been in, on a TrackMan. I just never had the data from um, the twenty one Atlantic League season. Um, and I, the the stuff I was sending him, it was like rap soto. So I know they're like wildly different. Um, but yeah, so I, I came in house, and Jason was like, okay. I see how your stuff plays now. And that also that same 21, 22 off season, I decided to go all in on throwing primarily sinkers. And, and then I saw a sweeper grip because I was working on a slider. Cause I knew that with my arm slot, a 12, six curveball is kind of a little out of the question. Um, so I saw the sweeper grip on Instagram and I just one day decided to try to throw it and I liked the shape of it. And I just, stuck with it and it turned out to be you know like an eye-opening pitch for me so t- take me through like take me through because i want to get into your pitch grips in a second but like let's go through the kind of transformation process because i mean your your transformation happened pretty fast like from january to like you were signed in may right by the giants mm-hmm. like you this was like a four month four or five month process um when you and and jason first kind of sat down took a look at your mechanics took a look and like s- set up a plan what were the biggest things that you guys set out to, to achieve? I know the weight room was a big thing, put on, put on weight, put on strength, but like, give me an idea of what that initial plan entailed. Well, my initial videos were you know, pretty up and down, like leg lift. Like I didn't get any internal rotation. I didn't like have any hip shoulder separation. They were all going as one. Um, and I, I didn't really capture my like momentum well. Um, and I, and I feel like I, didn't use my legs as well as I could have. There was a, there, I mean, honestly, there were a lot of different things that I tried to focus on and still can can get better at. Um, but I would say it was, you know, the leg lift and uh, just like the internal rotation and the separation. Awesome. What what about from like the from the nutrition side? Did you guys set like a body weight goal going into it, or or um, have like specific strength goals from the start that you're trying to hit? Yeah, I um I kind of been on my own weight program at the time, but I was also following a little bit of what my personal program was. But weight weight wise, I wanted to get to two fifteen, and I ended up getting to two twenty um, before spring, and I was really pumped about that. I was hammering like these shakes like twice a day, like these fifteen hundred calorie shakes, and yeah, right. I was really upping upping my. I had a calorie goal for each day, and I think it was like close to seven thousand. Um, but I was just hammering Chipotle and like really just going all in on trying to eat as much as possible. And you were around 200 pounds at this, at, like I, going yeah, into that Yeah, I was roughly, roughly 195, 200 going into that. 
give me an idea of some of your strength metrics like going into the offseason and then like towards the end of the offseason once you've got your velo up to you know 95 96 97 um can you yeah. remember any specific metrics like a squat like a dumbbell bench like a, a deadlift any any sort of numbers and how those changed as well as your body weight went up yeah so i got to roughly a 405 squat that was like my max but i was you know easily doing three uh three plates and i hadn't really been able to get above two um you know leading up to that and like and i struggled struggled with 225 and then on the i did straight bar bench a lot um that's like my favorite thing and still is uh, i know it's kind of frowned upon in baseball but i feel like it's been a, a benefit for me um so i did straight bar bench press and i was struggling to get it above like 155 and by the end of it i was you know repping 225 for about five and i was you know really proud of that you know i, I always wanted to like play football a little bit so mm -hmm. i kind of took a football right. strength right. Uh, look at it um but i got a lot stronger all around and i was you know super pumped about that yeah i think uh you know we definitely have certain guys who do bench press and like as long as the form is, is where it needs to be certain guys will tighten up if that's all they do and they don't do any mobility work other guys can mm -hmm. bench as much as they want or Ronald chapman right like he's always going to yeah. be mobile he's hyper mobile and so they really don't have to do a ton of extra mobility work but certain guys like will tighten up pretty quick like they'll tone up and so they do need to kind of counteract that with quite a bit of mobility work it just kind of depends right. on the guy um but certainly in your case i mean if you if you were doing 155 pounds like there's a huge strength deficit there like if, if yeah. i see a guy who's throwing low 90s benching 155 like squatting 225 or struggling with that like i mean you almost you don't know for sure but you kind of know that's a guy who should be mid upper 90s like that's that's yeah. a guy who's not even like remotely tapped into his potential. So I'm sure Foster was also excited to be like, your strength numbers are what? <laughs> that's what they're <laughs> yeah. what? you're throwing 92, and that's, I, those are your strength numbers. Yeah, I knew um, I knew that's where I definitely were was lacking, um, and I really you know I hammered it. So I was I was in there three to four times a week every week in the off season. Like I had friends thinking I was crazy, um, just like what are you doing? Like why are you like still trying to play? Like, so I just, I went all in on it. You did allude to it, but you, you mentioned that you have diabetes. I know Mason Miller and his story, he found out later on in his career that he had diabetes. It wasn't until he kind of like lost 20 or 30 pounds, I believe it was in college. Mm -hmm. And he was having all sorts of symptoms that he kind of was diagnosed. Once he figured that out, was able to manage it. He put on, you know, 70 pounds or whatever from that point. Yeah. And obviously he's become who he is now. Cause I'm not as familiar with your story when it comes to that. Like, is that something you knew earlier on in your career and like you were able to manage it? Is that something you found out later and in, you feel like influenced your ability to put on weight? Like take me through that diagnosis and how that influenced your nutritional approach. Well, I was diagnosed uh, a little earlier. I was diagnosed at 14. Um, and at the time I was, you know, I'm going through puberty and, and like not gaining weight and, and losing weight going through this. And it didn't make any sense. And I'm like the symptoms I was dealing with you know, excessive thirst, like frequent urination. And it's like, they were red flags. And then I had a moment where like I, had, I woke up in the, in the middle of the night with stabbing pains and, and they didn't go away. And I, I woke my mom up and we went to the hospital. And um, this was like a week before basketball practice in ninth grade. Uh, I mean, uh, back, basketball tryouts, excuse me. But, um, you know, I go to the, go to the hospital at like three in the morning. Uh, they run blood tests and see my blood sugars like through the roof. Um, I ended up going in an ambulance to a, a bigger hospital, uh, Danville, and I uh, stayed there for a few days while they, you know, kind of broke the news to me and the basics of how to manage it. And then it's just, like, you're kind of on your own. Uh, I logged it all for a while and then I got a pretty good sense of what I need to do. But that's always kind of been a challenge, but I've gotten much better with managing it, you know, in in college and then you know living abroad and doing it on my own I, I, I dialed it in a lot more do you have any advice for anybody watching this any kids watching this who maybe are trying to gain weight they are a pitcher um they do have a similar diagnosis and they're trying to figure out like how do i balance how do i manage this while also trying to eat you know a high carb high calorie diet put on weight get stronger throw harder like do you have one or two pieces of advice that really helped you that took you a while to figure out yeah so i think the hardest part when you're trying to like eat a lot of calories there's like maintaining a, a level blood sugar you know i would have times where i would spike up to 300 some 
and then trying to bring it back down, you kind of take too much insulin. And it, it, so finding a way to like balance it a little bit, I would suggest maybe pre bolusing before meals so that it can kind of catch it as it's going up and then, you know, bring it back down. So you're, you're not doing a big wave, um, trying to keep it as level as possible. And, uh, also not going low during workouts. Cause that, that hindered me a little bit where I'd have to cut stuff short because I'm going low. It's like, not because I, I don't want to be there, but it's like, I physically need to go get something to eat or drink. Right. Like I would Just bring managing, a Gatorade. The, managing the, the overall spikes and valley, the peaks and valleys of your blood sugar yeah. throughout the course of the day. So, so having a little bit of carbs think, throughout your workouts. Yeah. I think that's been the hardest part is like going low during an activity and, uh, and like not wanting to sound like you're making an excuse to a coach or, or anything, but you know, it's just something we have to deal with and, uh, and it's on us. So I guess having, having a few Gatorades or whatever with you when you go to the gym, just in case that happens. So you don't have to necessarily call that a day or like, especially pitching in a game when you're going low, like you got to be aware of like where your blood sugar's at before you go in or while you're warming up. Um, I've dealt with that a little bit. I actually had a, a, uh, an outing. This is the first time I've had this, uh, I had an outing in, in, uh, Salt Lake where I was like extremely low and I didn't, and I was unaware of it until after the outing. Luckily I, you know, managed to get through the outing and have a successful outing, but like that was just a, an extreme wake up call to me. It's like, okay, I can't have this happen. And when I was in the big leagues, I talked to Jordan Hicks about it. And he always like stays on the higher side on his, on his start days, just because he doesn't even want to have to deal with the possibility of going low. And that's, you know, that's kind of up to the person, but I like to, you know, balance it just a little bit high, not like dramatically. Um, Cause I'm still trying to, you know, keep my body and my, my organs healthy. Uh, that plays a part a little bit too, but. You know, just knowing yourself and knowing what you need are my biggest, you know, suggestions. Gotcha. How important was it uh, actually like tracking your calories? Is that is that something that you you got a little bit more religious about um, that off season? Actually making sure you were monitoring like what was going in, what was how much calories you were burning, and then also how many calories you were taking in, or had you tried tracking calories up to that point in your career? Yeah. So that specific off season, I was wearing a Fitbit and I was tracking how many calories I would burn. So I would, you know need to uh like incorporate that and then i'm also like writing down each thing i've eaten and how much a shake is and i'm counting the uh, the calories per day trying to get to i don't know if it was seven but i was trying to get to like five thousand calories yeah seven's a lot just to, like, yeah it was uh you know i was really just trying to get to like that, that five threshold you know if i can get close to that then i knew i was succeeding for that day yep i know in my case like I mean, obviously, sounds like you're a hard gainer, like had trouble putting on weight your whole career. I mean, I'm, mm-hmm. you're a little taller than me, but I'm 6'3". I was 155 pounds in high school, graduated at like 175. Um, and for me, just like real, like once I actually just started tracking calories, that was like, that was really the turnaround point. And I, I mean, yeah. in college, I needed 5,000 to gain weight because we were, you were running around to class. You're like walking miles a day. You're at practice four hours a day. Like mm-hmm. you barely have time to like eat. And like, so you're just, you're just trying to put in as many calories as you possibly can. So I remember that being like the hardest part, like that was harder than the lifts were the easy part, like the throwing the bullpens, that was the easy part. It was actually the lifting or the nutrition, not the lifting. That was the hard part. And like, Mm -hmm. that was like my full-time job, like trying to figure out how do I get 5,000 calories in on a given day? Like now I'm a little bit, a little bit less active. I'm not walking around across campus all day. I'm not at five hour practices a day. So like, you know, 3,500, 4,000 calories like is enough, but yeah. And for any, anybody watching this, who does fall into that hard gainer category, like, if you're not getting weight at 4,000, eat 4,200. If you're not getting weight at 4,200, eat 4,400. If you're not getting weight at 4,400, eat 4,600. And you literally can continue tearing that up until you you actually yeah. see the scale start to budge. And so like we've had guys that need 6,000 calories to gain weight. That's They're in the very, very, very minority. Um, most guys, you put them in about 1,000 calorie surplus and that's enough. And, and they're able to start yeah. seeing the weight budge. The, the strength starts to just absolutely shoot up in the weight room for the first time because they finally have that calorie surplus. Yeah, I would definitely recommend also just tracking it. Hundred percent. I, I don't know how you. I, I don't know how you get stronger in the weight room if you don't know how much weight is on the bar, and I don't know how you mm-hmm. can really 
uh, unless you're monitoring your body weight, the output, and you're monitoring the input, which is calories. I don't know how you can really have any any real assurance that what you're doing is working. Some guys obviously yeah. can, like some naturally like mesomorphic guys can just like look at look at a weight, look at a steak, and like get stronger. But like that wasn't me, that wasn't you, that that isn't a lot of guys that are gonna be watching this. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm curious. I want to actually go through your mechanics here because I, I do have. I'm gonna play this through, but you mentioned some of the mechanical changes, some of the flaws early on. But I'm curious uh, to kind of go through this frame by frame, and I want to hear your your input on some of the changes that, that you and Foster made. Um, and let's see if we can add you here. So if you need to like demonstrate anything or whatever, like feel free to. But so on the well, left, I, you were like I was saying, yeah, like I was saying earlier, I just went like my leg lift was just straight up and down. It wasn't even super high, and I got no counter rotation at all. Um, and I know some of the things we did with Foster were like the janitors and, uh, and just trying to hold that front side closed as long yep. as possible. Yep. So and, specifically yeah, here you're I, talking about like that, that leg, that leg is pretty much lifting, like your, your belt buckles facing third base, right? You never actually got, mm -hmm. got fully closed off. Whereas here it's like, you have a substantial amount of coil here, like your belt, your belt's facing shortstop. So you're working on more mm -hmm. like janitor, janitor drills, like basically coming set a little more closed with the pelvis to try to feel tension in that back hip. Yeah, and um, I did a lot, like, some of the stretches I was doing, like the door like the door frame stretch and, like, yep. uh, working on my, uh, I guess it would be oblique and, um, and lat. Uh, I, I worked a lot of soft tissue there and then with my hips as well, my hip mobility. It's still not great, but that, I mean, those things helped um, boost it. Like hip mobility, um, was it for you specifically opening up internal rotation or was it, like, more um, tightness through the adductors through the groin? Uh, I think more on the outer. I did a lot of the pigeon, uh, pigeon stretching and sure. um, just like elevated pigeon, like on a uh, just like on a bench. Um, uh, but but a lot of that helped a lot. And then my actual layback and my shoulder, and um, I did a, like a lot of lacrosse ball, soft tissue in here, uh, in the back of the shoulder. And uh, I think my my T spine needed a little bit of help. I started I started like rigorously like foam rolling and like aggressively foam rolling with like a PVC pipe, mm -hmm. and I think that's helped. Um, but but a lot, those were some of the major things. And like keeping my hit my head over my back hip longer was also a, a big cue that uh, Jason had given me in house. What about um? Because there's a couple things I want to ask you specifically about like um, during leg lift like. I obviously see like see the head. Is this something you you did in the past where you kind of like brought the eyes down and like had that like you see what I'm saying? Yeah, like, I kind of bring the eyes yeah, down yeah. as opposed to keeping like uh, zeroed in on the target the entire time. Yeah, I felt like I would like over concentrate on the catcher. Yep. Um, like like I would stare at him too long to the point where I would like almost lose focus. I know that doesn't really make a lot of sense, but yeah, I for me, if I can pick him up kind of late, then I I feel as though I get at that target a little bit more efficiently. Yep. So do you, you you obviously get the sign from the catcher? You have an idea, a focal point of where you want to throw the ball. You break your focus just for a split second, then you pick back up that focal point. Right? It's not like you just yeah. have no idea where you're throwing the ball, and then just like pick it up. Yeah, it's not way. like I'm I'm it's not like I'm turning around and just hucking that thing. I right. uh, I know obviously where the catcher's set up and what the pitch idea is. But I, I think for me, you know, picking him up kind of later helps me like get to that spot versus like while I'm staring at it the entire time, I almost like, I don't know, I almost get so focused that I become unfocused. Yep. That, I, I was the exact yeah. same way. Like I had to, I actually had to like look away from the target to throw more strikes. And I still wasn't like a, a super command guy, but like I was way more in the zone. And I, I remember having coaches even at that point, like telling me like, Anytime I walked, I like, if I walked a batter in an outing, they would try to tell me, like, you need to pick up the target, like, the whole time. Like, no, you don't understand. I've tried that. Like, I actually throw more strikes when I don't do that because it, it like, yeah. got me into that more athletic side of my mind where I wasn't, like, my, my eyes were almost, like, glazing over where I just couldn't hold that focus long enough. Exactly. Like, that fine focus. Yeah. You don't have to answer this if you don't want, but do you, do you have any sort of, like, ADD or ADHD tendencies at all? Like, have you had any sort of attentional, like, in other things where holding that attention is tough or is that... Uh, probably no, probably i don't have anything i don't have anything diagnosed i know i'm for sure dyslexic but that's not the question um but i you know I, i've got nothing like diagnosed or anything but i'm sure there's something 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm really interested in this topic because for, for me, I definitely have some intentional things in, in other areas of my life at times. Um, again, not diagnosed or anything, but um, certain players like do really well with the fine focus thing. They can like pick a super small size target, stare at it the whole time. And like, they're, they're definitely a command guy and it works for them. I can't even imagine doing that. Like, it just feels so, so bad to me with how my attention works that, you know, it's, it's something I'm interested in studying is like, why does like these half of players seem to do so well with, with breaking that focus? And why do these half of players so, do so well with like that fine focus the whole time? Um, mm -hmm. So again, that's, that's an area we probably won't know the answer to um, for a while, but it's, I'm just super interested in it because you just, it's easy enough for anybody watching this, like split test it. If you're not sure, like if you have command issues, try, try breaking your focus on the target. Try looking down as you lift your leg, pick it up a little bit later, see what happens. Yeah, I, I feel as though when I kind of look away in the leg lift that, I don't know, it helps me stay back and stay closed a little bit longer as well. That's just, I, that's just one of my cues. Is that something that you and Foster worked on or, or what, like, where did you pick that up? No, I just kind of like through trial and error um, and repetition, I, I just figured out that's something I do well and, and it's helped. Gotcha. What about, um, I know, well, during the, when, when Foster and I talked about keeping your head over your back hip. So I would, that was also a thing where I'm like lifting up and like trying to keep it back and then like uncoiling and, and unleashing, you know, the, the segmentation. Here's a side view just to kind of illustrate what you're, what you're talking about there. Mm -hmm. So your focus after you kind of get through that initial, initial leg lift, pick up the target is just head back, head back, head back. Because in yeah. the past, you started to leak forward a little bit too early, lose that stack. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What about, here's another thing that, that kind of stood out to me mechanically. Um, obviously, that coil initially during leg lift, but I mean, you're, you're holding close so much longer. Like if we look at this point right here, we look at that front foot, like you're mm -hmm. still completely sideways to the target. Your pelvis is facing sideways, the side of your, your cleat uh, facing the target. You can see here, you're like completely open. Is that something mm -hmm. like automatically took care of itself once you got that first move right or is that something where you were really trying to stay closed hold tension hold tension stay sideways as long as you can because like you're you're really holding that uh that back hip tension i mean pelvic I, torque a lot longer honestly i uh i still i still use the janitor drill and um i feel like that was a massive drill for me it taught me how to like actually feel that and um i i give that a lot of credit because i've kind of drilled that into my muscle memory at this point and um i never did that before i never did any sort of you know the some of the plyo drills that i've done with you guys that i got i really enjoyed like the uh like the figure eight and uh like obviously like the janitor drill the janitor drill is like by far my favorite um but i feel like that that drilled into me the fact that i can do these things I know you kind of had a moment where, you know, you and Foster have been working on something, some, some of these things, um, but because you were so close, you did come by the facility and get to work a little bit hands on. And there was something, something in there that clicked from what he, from what he had kind of relayed to me where like, you know, the next week or two, you were, you were 95, like 96, 97, like fairly soon after that is can, like, I'm sorry. Can you, can you like pinpoint a specific moment where that happened? Like, was it the janitor throw? Was it like trialing through that drill? Where like there was one specific throw, you were like, "Oh, that felt amazing." Something I did there like really clicked in. Um, can you like put your finger on what that was? Yeah, so it's gonna sound really simple, and I and I already actually kind of spoke on it, but it was keeping my head over my back hip as long okay. as possible. And I, you know, I've been doing all the things. I did all the plyos. Um, you know, they, it had been working for me, but I, I felt way more powerful and way more consistently powerful just trying to keep my head over by my back, my back hip. And I felt that helped me keep my load longer and delay rotation going down the mound. Um, I think that was, that was the thing that clicked for me when I came in house that I hadn't been told uh, sure. through remote. Gotcha. What about, um, what about arm slot? Right. Obviously your arm slot has, has dropped a little bit. We can see that right here. Um, mm -hmm. You've leaned into the sinker quite a bit more. Um, I know you still throw a four seam occasionally, but like, looks like you were kind of trying to carry, carry your four seam, had a little bit more of like a dead zone, uh, four seam shape at that point. Is mm -hmm. this something you like made a conscious choice to, to let your arm just drop a little bit, get more on the side of the ball? Um, take me through the slot. 
Yeah, um, you know, in the in the picture in the the video on the left, you know, I was still trying to throw a four seam. I was still trying to throw like a twelve six curveball, um, and I just wasn't what was working for me. Like uh, I knew that I need to make a change, and I, you know, I'd always been told that my two seam was good, but I I never really threw it primarily. Um, so when I took converted to like sinker sweeper, dropping down a little bit helped both of them. And it also helped my change up. So now I just kind of, I think sidearm in my head and it's, you know, it's hardly sidearm, but, um, you know, it, it, it helps me get to that spot where I think I do seam shifted wake. Um, and, I, and it helps me be a little bit more consistent. Uh, it's just, I haven't really thought about like dropping down, but right. that mentally helps me get to where my sinker is more effective and my change is more effective. And then it also helps my sweeper be more effective. So at, at this point in time, like having made these changes, um, like where's your head at in a game, in a game situation? Like, are you even thinking about your mechanics? Like, are you just trying to like get to your peak leg lift and then pick up the target and then go like, you, you don't even have to think about it at this point, or do you still have a couple of checkpoints that you run through? maybe in like pregame bullpen uh, or, or before yeah. you come in the game, um, when you actually get out there, like do you have a checkpoint that you try to hit in your delivery or, or to, if things are going wrong, like where you know you can make that adjustment or you're not even thinking about mechanics. Yeah. yeah I, there are the little, there's little things that I think about. I don't really think about like, you know, leg lift and staying closed as much anymore, but I think about heel connection. Cause that's always been something where I leak into my toes and become quad yeah. dominant. But it's I, I'm more consistent when I can like you know be smooth and stay in my heel and then kind of not necessarily open up with my with my uh, landing leg, but like I feel as though when I'm going towards the the left-handed batter's box, I don't really get there, but like that's where I'm mentally feeling. And if I can stay in my stay in my heel, get to the full leg lift, and then like slowly open up into that. I feel as though my stuff, you know, is more commandable. And the, the times where I become a little bit more wild or when I'm leaking towards the, the right-handed batter's box more and I can kind of feel myself going toe and quad dominant again. But th that's about the only thing I, I can consciously think about out there. Other than that, I'm just, you know, trying to compete. Trying to execute. Do you, do you feel like um, as far as like where the effort in your delivery comes from, do you feel like that has changed? Like, do you feel like now you're actually throwing a little more with the, with the lower half with the backside um, versus before is more arm? Or do you feel like now it's, you're still trying to throw hard with your arm, but it's a little bit more timed up and using your entire body. Like where is the effort coming from now versus before? I'd say before I was definitely like all arm. Um, you know, I, you know, would get a long uh, leg, like long uh, stride. And I felt like that was, was part of it that's what I was always kind of told in some of my old pitching pitching stuff um but now I feel a little bit more effortless you know I feel as though my legs are loaded properly and you know I can kind of be smooth and then you know it just kind of jumps out at the end if I'm getting my arm in if I'm all in sync I feel like I can still be smooth and not trying to do too much the times where I try to do too much is typically where my velo drops a little bit or things go, you know, right. out of the zone. And so it's just being about being smooth. And I remember like, I'm not this person, but DeGrom always talked about, you know, being smooth ended up being his highest, highest velos. So I, I try to think about that and, and uh, it has worked for me. So with your lower half, are you trying to like push off the rubber? Are you trying to get down the mound? Like as far as you can, are you trying to like, uh, feel forced into the ground or are you more so just trying to like ride that coil that tension you've created and just like unload and be more rotational like t take me through that like was the thought process before more like push off and now it's more rotate um or do you not even think about that yeah. it's more like just let the janitor before of itself. i felt as though before on the left side that i wasn't really riding my my back leg and i was just kind of pushing it and now I feel as though when I'm heel connected, I can use my leg to not push, but drive myself that way. And, um, and that's, that's been super helpful with also the lack of, um, lack of effort with my arm. And it just kind of has timed me up a little bit better. So there isn't necessarily like a, a push from the quad, but you still feel like you're able to ride, you're able to ride your, your backside down the mound. 
but yeah. Not, so it was a put. It was a push from the quad and the and the left side, and yep. now I feel like I'm a little bit more in my butt and like not necessarily pushing, but just driving with my leg with my foot still in the ground and like the outer portion of my leg and and my and my butt. You know, I I feel like a, I'm powerful coming down the mound now. You're feeling more activation on the outer outer glute outer hip, 100%, and then when you actually yeah. when you actually come to rotate into landing, are you like? thinking about rotating hips as far, hard as you can, or are you just letting it kind of flow and like float through into landing and just like try to be smooth at that point? Or are you like trying to rip the hips through? No, I, I honestly just think about being smooth and, uh, oh. and landing where I'm, I'm trying to land, like not too much to the right, but like a little bit more dead center. And yeah. typically it all just flows through. And the ones I really get good are when my back leg comes flying around, like at finish. Sometimes I kind of uh, like recoil a little bit and those are also very effective, but I feel as though I could be more efficient with that back leg coming through and not stopping and recoiling. What about, what about the arm? Um, do you think about like bringing the arm into the throw or just kind of let that naturally happen? Like, are you, are you actively trying to like bring the arm into the throw and like throw as hard as you can from the arm? Or are you just kind of letting that energy work its way up? Uh, from the hips to the torso and just like whenever the timing is right you just like let that wave of energy come up like what what's your thought process about like or what do you at least feel happen on your best you know 97 mile an hour bullets um with the arm yeah i uh so i work um i guess it would be like a, a corner a corner drill like in pre-stretch so i'm trying to like stretch my pec and get into deep layback so i feel as though that's helped me get my arm deeper and like with less effort, like I feel like I would be muscled up on the video on the left, like trying to throw hard. So again, it's just about being as loose as possible and like on time and in sync. And the, like the honestly, the times where I throw the hardest are when I would think I'm throwing 92. Right. So it's just, like, you know, being during, smooth and, and on time. During handbrake here, like you're, you're pretty much like, you're relaxed with the arm. This, this, this arm swing is just like a fluid, like you're just like floating the arm there. Right. You're not, you're yeah. not trying to like yank the arm up or pull the arm behind your body. You're literally just like letting it float into that position. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then that, that mobility aspect helped too, like opening up the pecs, opening up the chest, um, working to actually have the range of motion to get into a little bit deeper stretch positions. hundred percent. Yeah. We, I mean, we have some really good trainers too, that help me work with soft tissue as well. Like on top of the things that I do. Awesome. Um, I know people wanted to see your pitch grips too. That, that was a that was a request we got. So, sure. Um, you have a baseball handy. I do. I got one right here. <laughs> okay. Can we can so, we see your sinker um, to start? Sure. Um, I'll try to flip the camera if that's possible. Okay. Well, here, I just throw a standard two seam. It's thumbs down here on this bottom seam. Fingers are evenly spread apart on the seams, like equal pressure. Uh, it's. I think it's honestly just something that I, you know, I'm pretty fortunate to have because I didn't have a good four seam ever. And I always kind of wondered why it got hit. And it was mainly because it was dead zone all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, you know, two seam switched to it full time. And, you know, I get pretty good numbers on it. I get anywhere from, you know, the highest will be like seven vert. And then I'll get down to the zero line. So primarily it's like four to I'd say um but yeah so two seems pretty standard you know I, you know everybody calls it that's, sinker now but I throw just a traditional two seam that's a pitch that for you I think you said improved once you let your, the arm slot drop a little bit so once you stop trying to get yes. on top of a four seam and just like let the arm drop a little bit more in plane um that's when mm -hmm. that pitch really took off yeah I I think that's more of my natural arm slot you know I was always forcing the four seam to try to be on top of it. And like I had a 12, six curveball and mm -hmm. trying to force it to be on top. And that just, you know, it just wasn't working and I knew I needed to change it a little bit. Now, do you have, uh, uh, do you have metrics as far as like, I'm, I'm sure you're a little bit of a supinator um, from the sound of it. Do you, do you have, yeah. I mean, to be able to get a little bit of that seam shift action as well, because you're, you're, I mean, your sinker moves more than you would expect from just like a high, high, like full hundred percent spin efficiency uh, sinker from that arm slot. So do you, do you have an idea off the top of your head, like what your efficiency numbers are? Like, are you 85% efficient, 80% or at least know if you're getting seen? Honest, honestly, I, I know it's not a hundred. Um, okay. 
I haven't really looked at the efficiency because, you know, I just haven't really needed to, to yeah. change a whole lot. Uh, I had to change a little bit with my change up grip though. Um, in spring training, I worked with our, you know, our big league, one of our big league pitching coaches, uh, JP Bar- Martinez. And I was always trying to like throw my change up with the ring finger on the outside of the seam. It's like thinking that I, you know, pronated it. Um, and I, you know, I wasn't, wasn't doing that, but it was still okay. Um, so I've switched to, since I throw a two seam to just a, a two seam change up grip and, uh, thumbs down here. Um, it's, it's really nothing crazy. I try to hold it light and just rip it the same arm speed. You know, I, I've been getting some really good ones this year. I, and especially in the big leagues, I was probably averaging like negative one, negative two vert and roughly a little bit less horizontal uh, than my two seam, but you know, getting the negative vert for, for me was like massive. Like I'm noticing, and I throw it still pretty firm. I throw it, you know, 88 to 90, you know, being a mid mid nineties guy, like it's enough to get off my fastball. Right? For sure. Some of the swings I've gotten up there, I've, you know, I've, I've noticed it's actually a very effective tool for me. And I've been and using so it more. That are you just trying to come straight through it like a fastball? Are you feel are you feeling yourself cut it slightly, or are you trying to get on the inner part and and slightly pronate or turn it over? Honestly, it's the same. Like I feel the same way with with my two seam. Um, so I'm sure it's it's gripping the seams like kind of um, like this is on top, and it's kind of just gripping that. Uh, Can you feel how it to, comes? I, to be honest, you... I don't how you think of it coming off your fingers again, the reality might be different, but what's, what's your thought process, how it comes off the fingers? Yeah. So again, I just, I literally, I just think it's a two seam, but different grip. Um, and I'm just trying to get that same kind of spin. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not great with the, the technical terms. Uh, I, I think I seem shift wake. I've talked to Jason about it a little bit. I'm sure he could probably clarify what I do. Um, but yeah. And then, it's it's all basically two seam grips. Uh, so I throw my sweeper like on the inside of the seams a little bit. Sorry, yeah, a, a standard uh, two seam sweeper grip. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. And um, are you yeah, trying I've to get inside of that? Like, what's your cue? What's your cue with this with the sweeper um, release? I think like it's all about being a little bit lower, and and it's not that dramatically lower, but. Um, just trying to rip it off like a fastball at the times where I'm trying to do too much is the times I'll back it up or like throw it in the other batter's box. But as long as I can stay behind it, as long as I can stay behind it as long as possible. And then that late, late, so you're not uh, necessarily action. like trying to be all the way on the side of it and like throw the side of your hand or throw a curveball or anything. Like you're, well, you're thinking a little bit more behind it. Well, I'm trying to be a little bit more firm with it. You know, I, yep. when I was first throwing it, it was like 77 to 80. And now I've been a little bit more in that 80 to like 83, touching 84 with it and still yep. not have the, you know, 17 to 20, but I'll get like 13 to 16. And that's, and it's still been extremely effective in some of the swings I've gotten, you know, show me that. Yeah. That's, that's one of the things I'll t- tell my guys is like, we don't need to necessarily chase a 20 inch horizontal break on a sweeper because mm-hmm. a, that pitch becomes really tough to command. Now certain guys have no problem commanding it. And like, if you can do that, great. But you're also there's going to be a, a velocity and movement trade off. So like, you think of like Blake trying in slider. It's like okay, that's not 20 inches of horizontal. That's like 12. But like that's super nasty at 87. So like, yeah. could he throw a 20 inch one at 82? Yeah. But like, it's still a super nasty pitch. And so like, yes, it's going to be a little less movement, but you're going to throw it harder. You're probably going to have better command of it. You're going to know where it's going. And so like, getting away from having to always always just try to chase like maximum. Uh, you maximum horizontal on a sweep or like maximum vert on a four seam. Like there's more that goes into it than just like max shape. Yeah. My, my thought process, like in low a, um, I felt as though I could, I could throw the 20. I could probably still throw the 20 if I really wanted to. But um, like, I think having a little bit more velo for me hides it a little better. Um, I feel like when I was throwing it 77 to 80 with, with 20, like it was very visible. Hmm. Um, and I, you know, I probably wasn't locating it as great as I am now. Um, but I feel as though me ripping it at, you know, full intent, trying to make it like a sharper slider, but also it technically being a sweeper has helped a lot. You know, um, I get, you know, dumber swings. I get, 
more like better swings that I want to see versus guys that I know are sitting back waiting on it and then like taking it to right field. Do you think about tunneling at all? Like, do you think about having everything come out of that same that same slot? Sinker moves here, sweeper moves there, and like, like do you have a specific yeah. focal point that you tunnel everything through, or is that not really something you you put a ton of thought into? No, yeah, I've been thinking about it a lot more because, you know, in big league camp, you know, I, I the pitching coaches will talk to us about how our stuff plays and where people's hot zones are. Um, so I've been thinking about it a lot more these past couple years, like front hipping sinkers and then going cutter in off of those and then like how my change up plays to righties so if i'm going sinker into righties and then i can drop that in that same kind of quadrant and it drops down you know i i've been mixing in the four seam too which is nothing crazy i do uh on the outs like so the horseshoes on this side when i'm you know when i'm pitching um and that has been i use it so little that it's also nice. been playing well and it's just always up in the zone. Um, this was one pitch I actually kind of think I fooled Otani with because I don't think he was expecting me to go up and in with a four seam. Or I also saved my cutter because I hadn't thrown a cutter in the big leagues until I started against the Dodgers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I need something to get lefties off of kind of sitting away off the plate. Um, so I've been incorporating the cutter in the lefties and then a little bit to righties away when they're sitting sinker, just trying to get like a little weak ground ball or something like that. And can you show the cutter grip again? Yeah. So got four seam right. with the, sorry, with the horseshoe out here and that's, you know, straight on. Um, and then I bring it down one seam yep. to like a, like a four seam with the horseshoe out here. And then it's kind of, and it's kind of like, offset and i think can you see that yep so i i try to think uh like football like a football spin so we play i mean i throw football to uh like you know to warm up for a pitcher stretch and if i can spiral a football i can i know i can throw a cutter well and it's it's literally the same thought process i'm trying to just throw it like a football yeah and your your cutter is a little bit more like gyro shaped like it's not necessarily like this big carry cutter and that makes sense with with your thought process so like if you're if you're cueing like true gyro spin Right, you're, it makes sense that ball is going to approach more like the zero zero, like true gyro. Uh, but you're throwing that one mm-hmm. hard. Like that's that's I think eighty eight ninety, eighty nine ninety. Yeah. Um, and you're I think I, look, I looked at the metrics. Like you were getting five vert, like under five vert at times. So that's mm-hmm. that's almost like kind of between the cutter and, and gyro slider type shape. Yeah, I uh, it's it's been effective when I've been able to execute it. That's been kind of some of the issue this year is hadn't been able to. Um, executed as well as i wanted in triple a but you know i was able to do it in the big leagues so just been working on it more now and i'm feeling way more comfortable now and confident um coming down coming being uh being optioned down so it's really just about trying to hammer each zone and have an intent with each pitch now is where my process is i'm curious like i'm curious about the actual uh the the debut like Could you take us through when you found out, how you found out? And then I'm curious, like, once you actually got out there for that very first outing, like, what's going through your mind? Like, that's got to be the coolest feeling ever. But, like, take me through, like, how you found out in the first place and then, like, that next 24 hours up until that that first outing. Yeah, so we were on a road trip in Reno. um, And Reno is, like, probably four hours from uh, San Francisco and, like, an hour and a half from SAC. Um, so we were in Reno and it was the seventh inning and I had been closing games in, uh, in AAA. So it's time, it's a typical time where I'm starting to get loose and move around. Um, you know, I'm not quite sure if I'm going two innings for the eight, nine, or if I'm going just nine. So they called down the, to the bullpen and one of my teammates, Justin Garza, who you know, he's has a few years in the show and I've really bonded with him. Um, he, he turns and looks at me and he's like, Biv, they want to see you in the dugout. And I was just like, what? Like, like yeah, yeah everyone, you kind of hear that and you're like, okay, something's yeah, they're happening. they're messing with you. Yeah. But I was, I didn't really know because I'm, you know, preparing to go in the game. It's a close game too. So I'm like, okay. I go down and Dave Brundy, who's our manager, um, he's like kind of beating around the bush. He's like, hey, Biv, I just want you to know like why we're not using you today. You know, it's typically a time where, you know, I know you'd be getting loose, but I want you to just be ready and uh, know that I'm, you know, co- I'm confident in you and, 
you know, you're, you'll get in there. But, and I'm like, all right, just like about to walk away. And he's like, but I want you to know, like, I, I want you to be ready in San Francisco tomorrow when you, when you, <laughs> when you debut. And I was like, blown away. I didn't even know how to, I didn't know if he was serious. Like, just like, I'm going to the show. Like, you're going to the show. And, uh, everyone that was in the dugout like came and dapped me up and all the coaches and we had one of our pitching coordinators there who kind of really knows my story so it was it was really special um that was super cool so I had to get going immediately because I had to catch a flight so I grabbed I went down to the bullpen dapped up all the guys and they were all really happy for me got my stuff sprinted across the field to find out that there aren't any more flights it's like nine o'clock in Reno um, uh, calling my mom. She's not answering. I call my dad and I'm like, you're going to have to get out here and probably early flight. And he's like, Oh, I can't make it. Like, I can't make that uh, happen. And I was like, you, we only get one of these. So you better do your best. And, uh, you know, the giants are extremely good with, you know, getting our families out there. So I got him on a flight at like 6am out of, he lives in Virginia beach and I got him out. Um, his flight actually got delayed in Denver. So he got to the game late, got there like the seventh inning. My mom, you know, I called her. She ended up answering the phone, and she got on a similar flight, like five thirty, six in the morning out of Charlottesville, got to the game, watched my full debut, and, you know, I got to see them after the game, and it was it was really cool. And But getting ready for that game, it was a, it was a 1 o'clock, and I had, had to drive a rental car from Reno to Sacramento, kind of pack up my stuff at my apartment, leave the rental car at the field. And then they had a car service, pick me up and take me to the team hotel. Um, I didn't get in until like three o'clock. Didn't get to bed till about four, four thirty. woke up eight o'clock. I go right over to the field and like can hardly eat. I'm just trying to make sure that my blood sugar is, you know, in a good spot and, uh, and I'm drinking water. Uh, I did, I, I've never been like a performance anxiety, like throw up guy, but I did throw up for the debut. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I, and Bob talked to me about the situation cause we had an opener that day and I saw who was starting. I was like, okay, he's probably only going one. And they called me in the office. Like, babe, you're probably going to be in there in the second inning. Um, and I knew that I needed to go long. Um, so I ended up going three innings, one run. Uh, and it was like the first AB, you know, I, I, I K'd Neto, um, showed some pretty good stuff. I, my two scene was really moving that day. And then the next guy first pitch with a dead center solo shot. Yep, saw that. So it, it was like uh super high, super low. And then like, all right, now it's normal baseball. Yeah, so well, it was, it was, it was a pretty cool debut. And I, and I also got the win. Um, it, you know, it was really special. What was it like getting, getting that one, like uh, under your belt as far as like finally just having that experience out of the way, like the, the following outing, like, like, what was it like just going from, like, that first time being, like, like throwing up before the game to kind of settling into a groove? Yeah, I uh, – so the second one, we got on a flight right to Chicago and still, like, trying to let it sink in. And I, we got into Chicago at, like, 2 a.m. And I wake up and open the blinds in my hotel room, like, downtown Chicago on, like, a 16th floor. And it's like, dang, that really did happen. So I really am in the big leagues. <laughs> Um, and then the second outing, it was back to kind of a traditional bullpen role. Um, is again, it was like, I was going to be in there early. Um, so we had like, we had like two starters at the time. We had a lot of injury. So I was kind of piggybacking, uh, Eric Miller again, um, went in and Chicago was hostile. It's Wrigley and it's loud. And, um, so that, that was like, I was comfortable, but I was like, all right, you really got to be on your A game at all sure. times in the big leagues. Um, I pitched two two clean innings at first, and then I came out. I got hit with a line drive in my throwing arm um, at the end of the second inning. And it, was, it was okay. Like, I wanted to stay out there, and they, I convinced them to, you know, send me back out there. Um, and I gave up two back-to-back homers from Hap and Swanson. And then I walked a guy, and it was like that was it. So I got a rough one, and I had a good one, and I had a rough one right back to back. And then I figured out that people like to talk shit, so I, oh, yeah, uh, I deleted my deleted my Twitter app, and I was like, "All right, I uh, maybe should clean up my privacy settings a little." But after that, I felt I felt very comfortable. Um, 
I don't know when the next time I went, when I pitched, I pitched again, not the Chicago. I did not pitch at Rick Wood. And then I pitched in St. Louis through a scoreless inning, did well there. And then we went back to San Fran. I pitched against the Cubs again and kind of redeemed myself, you know, had a one, two, three, like seven pitch inning. Uh, ended up Kang Swanson on a really good changeup because I don't think he thought I'd throw him that. Yeah, and then I started against the Dodgers, uh, and that was like the coolest moment I've in my life. Um, you know, I'm growing up, and I know the Dodgers are the Dodgers, and like we're the Giants. I'm a part of this rivalry now, and they're expecting me to go deep because I'm spot starting, and our bullpen's depleted. So it was just really cool to be out to to go out there and deliver for the guys and and pitch well and get a win against the Dodgers and face guys like Freddie Freeman and Otani. Freddie Freeman actually was super cool. Uh, his first at bat against me, he gave me like a little like head nod. I don't know if it was you know paying respect or like a welcome to the show, but it was that was really cool of him to do that. I I was so locked in that I didn't even like realize that that happened. So like I gave him like a delayed like oh shit head nod um but it it was just super cool to get to start a big league game i always see myself you know as a starter i still i still want to be a starter but i'm grateful to have an opportunity regardless what was that uh otani about like that first one well i faced him i faced him three times he led off the game i think first pitch was a uh, sinker close but it was a ball and then the next one he took and it was for a strike so I think he was expecting sinkers, and I uh, busted him in with a cutter in, got him to ground out, made a, made it pretty close at first. Um, had to go cover, and I, you know, made a it was kind of a, a tough throw, made a good play, and got him out, and I almost ran into him. And I was like, damn, he's pretty quick. Um, and then the second at bat, I think, there, I don't know if there was anybody on base, but uh, ended up striking him out with a fastball, a four seam fastball up and in. Again, I don't think he was. You know, anticipating that. And then the third one, uh, there was a guy on second. I had already given up a home run, a solo home run in the inning. I knew the inning was getting kind of long, um, and I knew that I was probably going to be my last hitter. Um, and I you know you got to go five as a starter to get a decision. So I, you know, I – and my, it's funny because, like, that inning, I remember my velo was down to, like, 92, 93. Like, you know, I hadn't really gone that long in two years. Um, and I remember the, my velo coming back for Otani cause I was locked in for him, you know, two seam away, uh, I swung through for like, it was like 95 and then four seam up, swung through, uh, and then sweeper back foot perfectly executed. I was just super hyped to be able to execute all three pitches against him. And, and I obviously let out a, a hype fist pump and it was just like 10 years worth of emotion coming out in that a little bit yeah I'm, I'm curious like i want to like what is what's something like people don't really see or understand like about what that journey is like um because i mean your journey you've, you've kind of gone through it now but like, you've been all over like you've been you've been putting in you put in your decade of, of chasing this dream like like what's something people just don't get or don't see that like you think they should realize like about the about the minor leagues about any ball like just what don't people see uh, people, people don't see that, you know, I was not a prospect of any kind, like high school, college, like even in pro ball, um, you know, I was very average high schooler. I've, I've been busting my ass for a while. And, um, you know, I know people kind of look at some major leaguers like, oh, you know, he was always good, this and that. Um, but for me, I, I know some Dodgers fans were upset. And I thought, like, I'll act like you've been there before. But, like, that was such a huge moment for me in my career. Like, I, I got to start a game in the big leagues and against the, the best team and do my job and do it well. And, like, after all this time, after all the people that have been like, you're not good, like, you should think about something else. And, like, all the time my mom is like, you know, leaned on me to – given me the opportunity to like stay at home and not have to worry about housing and just being super supportive and all my family and all my friends. And it's, it's been a 
extremely taxing mental challenge to get to this point. And now that I'm here, I'm going to make the absolute most of it. Do you feel like you would change anything about your story now? Having, having gone through everything you did, like, would you change it? Do you wish it was an easier path or, or are you kind of grateful for the, the winding path? I mean, it, it'd be easy to say, I wish it was easier, but if I had the traditional get drafted as a junior or a senior, like, I don't think I, I get here and I'm as successful. Like I, I may, I may get to like double A. I feel like if I don't do tread, if I don't have the road I have, I, I don't think I succeed in pro ball to this extent. Like I, I feel like I needed every, every trial and tribulation. Like it made me, made me tougher, made me better, made me more mentally ready. So I, no, I wouldn't yeah. change it. Do, do you, did you always like believe that you could be a big leaguer like through the whole process or was it just like, I'm just going to see what happens. Like, did, did you, did you truly always believe that like you had the, you had the capacity to, and like, if so, what, why? Like when all, when all the evidence was like suggesting otherwise, um, like I want to, I want to know like what made you think you could be a big leaguer when you weren't a prospect? I, uh, I don't know. When I was a kid, I, you know, I fell in love with sports like a lot of people do. Um, and I always knew that I wanted to be an athlete. Like I always knew that it was always in the back of my head. I, I tried plenty of other things, but I always wanted to be an athlete. Um, and I fell in love with baseball when the Red Sox won the world series and broke the curse. And it was, I, there were times where like, you know, baseball wasn't my favorite sport, but it's just always been the most consistent in my life. Um, I just always knew like I would be selling myself short if I didn't become the athlete I thought I could be. And, you know, there was plenty of times, you know, I, I didn't work that hard. I just thought I would, you know, get there. And I finally took me like really giving it everything that I've got to actually see the kind of potential I could have. And I feel like there's more in there. Um, but I, I, I just always knew I wanted it and I wasn't going to settle for anything else. A lot of my friends work, you know, normal corporate jobs or do, you know, work at the university or work, you know, their parents, uh, their, their parents, uh, company, or I just knew that I, I wanted, I just knew I wanted it. I always wanted it. Looking back, do you have any advice for, for the younger, uh, Spencer Bivens? Like if you could go like, grab 15 year old Spencer Rivens and like shake him and tell him something like, what would you tell him? I tell him to get in the weight room. <laughs> okay. But, uh, I would tell him get in the weight room and, you know, work on your using your legs. And I'd probably tell him to make some smarter decisions. Yep. Awesome. Well, I just, I mean, I just want to thank you for like letting us play some small part in your journey. I mean, this is like why we do what we do. This is why like we started tread in the first place is like, connecting good coaches with athletes that like want it, want to put in the work. And like, if we can play some small parts, like it's just really cool to see the success. I, I hope you have another decade of success um, at the big league level, but um, just want to thank you for letting us play a part in that journey. Thank you very much, Ben. I've been, I had been following you for a while and uh, it's pretty cool to finally, you know, get to chat with you. Um, I'm not here without tread. Um, it's exactly what I needed at the exact time I needed it. And it was the best money I ever spent. Yeah, looking forward to having you back out here, getting you on the mocap, uh, shooting the shit a little bit. And uh, yeah, just really appreciate the time. I know you're, um, you are you got to fly here pretty soon to catch to, to get back out there for the second half. So um, best of luck the second half. And again, thanks again for the time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.